here at the Fraser Center. I hope you and all your loved ones are safe during these unprecedented times. Specifically today, we had the warmest weather in Toronto so far this year, so we're happy for that. And for those celebrating the Feast of Annunciation, we wish you a happy one. Uh, my name is John Dodosky, and I'm a professor here at Regis College and the director of the Monsignor John Mary Fraser Center for Practical Theology. I will begin with the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto and Regis College operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Scarborough Missions Recognition. The programming offered by Monsignor John Mary Fraser Center for Practical Theology and the Scarborough Missions Chair of the Interreligious Dialogue was made possible through the Scarborough Missions Legacy. Scarborough Missions is the Society of Apostolic Life of Canadian Catholics, priests, and laity, motivated by the Spirit and dedicated to the person, teaching, and missions of Jesus Christ as expressed in the words, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. The Scarborough Missions Legacy seeks to further its ministry work by providing financial assistance to deserving organizations with like-minded objectives. I would like to introduce our Associate Director of the Fraser Center, who uh, really carries the ball, and her, this is Sister Petite Lau. She is a doctoral candidate here at TST and at Regis College, and we're most grateful for all her help and support. Ashley Tran is our tech support. She is also an MDiv student here at Regis College. Um, and we're grateful to her support this year. While we prefer to meet face-to-face -face rather than through a glass darkly, in the interest of preserving some interaction, we invite your questions to be sent through the comments function on Zoom. While we may not get to all the questions, we will try to collate and address some after the speakers. I'll introduce the speaker and the respondent together. Um, the speaker, Pamela Kucher, has been the Jane and Jeffrey Martin Chair in Church and Community at Emanuel College since 2010. Professor Kucher has been Director of the Toronto School of Theology since January 1, uh, 2020, and has Reset us through the UT CAP process, so we're all very grateful to her for that. Uh, she has a PhD in practical theology from the University of Chicago and has been an officer of the International Academy of Practical Theology, which she hosted in Toronto in 2013. She is ordained in the Northern Illinois Conference of the Meth United Methodist Church and is an ecumenical associate at St. Luke's Anglican Church in Burlington. She is the author of four books that have dealt with the feminization of poverty, children's poverty in the US and internationally, and most recently, religious peace building in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The creative writing major in her undergraduate years, she began in 2005 to study techniques of literary nonfiction and incorporate them into her research and writing. The respondent, Professor Esther Akalatse, is an associate professor of pastoral theology and intercultural studies at Knox College since 2017. She teaches at the intersection of psychology and Christian thought in aid of human flourishing with interest in the gendered body, cultural anthropological dimensions of medicine, health and healing, and their implications for suffering, death, dying, 
and the care at the end of life. Her ongoing research explores methodological issues in practical theology of Christian life and the relevance of these themes in the global expression of Christianity, particularly African and Western dimensions and dialogue. Her robust publications include two books, Power, Principalities and the Spirit, Biblical Realism in Africa and the West, and For Freedom, or Bondage, a critique of African pastoral practices. So we are very grateful to have them both here tonight. And without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Kucher. Thanks, John. I wanna thank you. I wanna thank Sister Petit Lau, and I wanna thank Ashley Tron and Esther, the respondent, Esther Ekalatze. Um, and the Fraser Center community for the opportunity to deliver the second le annual lecture on practical theology, especially under these strange COVID circumstances in which we find ourselves. I want to dedicate this address to all of the Toronto School of Theology students who are trying to study or write dissertations during COVID. The assumption behind this address that I wanna to communicate to them is that the care with which we write our research is as important as the research itself. Lost and found. Our losses can be temporary. Once I discovered my passport wallet missing at Pearson Airport and retrieved it from the lost and found. Or permanent. Last winter, I pawed through the four baskets of hats and gloves at Union Station, searching for my favorite Manitoba muckluck beaded mittens and came up empty handed. Losses can be profound as when loved ones die. Losing something can be the context for finding something else. Somet sometimes that something else is faith in God. The theme of lost and found runs through the selections I've chosen for tonight. COVID-19 has left us with a social loss, maybe even collective trauma. As the director of the Toronto School of Theology, I deal with COVID casualties every day. For one, COVID has disoriented academics and scholarship. For a year, we have not had immediate access to libraries or to research with human subjects that we depend on. Personally, I'm separated from 95% of my academic books by 1200 kilometers. I am living nowhere near a theological library. I miss my Canadian academic surroundings keenly. But this lecture could be classified as a found essay. I have found sources for this lecture, including my own book, We Are Not All Victims, in our local library, in the few books I had in my possession when I returned to Hatfield, Wisconsin, and in several that I've downloaded onto my Kindle. They are found in the sense that this wandering of imagination is hardly as systematically researched as I would have liked. In writing this lecture, I've wanted to follow a lead, reach for that blue book on my shelf to verify what I remembered. Still, found theology may be characteristic of spirituality and theology, not only in COVID-19, but in the secular age in which we live. One of the ethical problems facing all theological or spiritual writers is the relationship between the writer and the communities our writing represents. The writer's self, the I, and even the community may be implicit or explicit on the page, but they are always present. The writer may choose a formal, open, or poetic theological or spiritual voice, each with its own epistemic assumptions. In each of the five scenes that follow, the partnership between the writer and the community they represent has a different answer to the question, in the midst of loss, how does spiritual life writing lead us to find theology and maybe even faith? Scene one, self explicit, community explicit, poetic voice. Betsy Warland's prose poems, Lost Lagoon, Lost in Thought, 
are infused with the spirituality of a settler walking indigenous lands, noticing as a resident rather than a visitor, the colonized history and changed living patterns of Vancouver's body of water called Lost Lagoon. She precisely poses the question that I encountered early in my research for We Are Not All Victims, that every writer answers. As Warland writes in prose poem number 48, tied out, it's as if walking through an extensive library, the stories and natural histories of this Salish sea coast embedded in the plethora of rocks. Many configurations and composites the human has not previously seen. Indigenous people, people's beliefs that rocks are our ancestors resonates more and more in the human's bones. Once again, the human is reminded how an unstoried lost lagoon is due to erasure and repurposing. Reminded how vulnerable a small body of water is to human whim and ignorance. Realizes how little recorded history there is, how land and water formations are disturbed beyond recognition how little old growth trees are left to tell the tale. On the lagoon's north shore, there is almost no visible trace of its midden. All the lagoon's saltwater life died when the causeway was sealed off from tidal life. Settler cabins were removed during causeway construction. When the lagoon was drained during the construction, the Vancouver Trades and Labor Council adamantly opposed the idea of an artificial lake and lobbied to have it filled in to create another sports field. The question arises, who has the right to shape and tell the story, destroy story, for story decides everything else. In 20 words, Warland pierces the ethical problem of the writerly eye in relationship to any representation of a community to a readership. Who has the right to shape and tell the story, destroy story, for story decides everything else. Scholars and writers of spirituality and theology represent communities, other people on the pages of their work. Those people may be dead and unable to correct the story or may be alive and would tell the story a different way. In representing any community in the name of expertise, scholars and writers walk along the narrow ridge of hubris and arrogance each time they write. I'm using the metaphor of ridge rather than cliff because when we walk the edge of a cliff, we know we must take pains not to tumble. On a ridge path, the drop may be precarious, but hidden by brush at the side of the path. We may be deluded into thinking that the precipice isn't there. Scene number two, memoir, self-explicit, community implicit, open voice. On Thursday, March 12th, 2020, after the first annual Fraser Center Lecture in Practical Theology, I paced the corner of Wellesley and Queen Park Crescent in Toronto, Ontario, peering into the night, matching the shape of the oncoming headlights with their vehicle sounds, the wide beams and lumbering chug of city buses, the narrow squints and whir of electric cars that diminish suddenly as they come to a stop, the wide angle headlights and hum of gas vehicles. Then, of a moment, familiar headlights separated themselves from the oncoming rush and veered from Queens Park onto Wellesley. I recognized the outline of my husband, husband's Mitsubishi Outlander. It rolled to a stop. I ran behind the car, pulled open the door, slid onto the front seat under my Sheltie Nicholas, clipped my seatbelt, and we sped away. And so began, without our knowing it, our COVID-induced flight from Toronto. As we sped down the Gardner Parkway, we did not yet realize 
that our lives had now turned toward an unknown future and life-changing decisions. During that day, I had struggled to process the information about the novel coronavirus that I read in email and heard on public airways. That morning, I had blissfully ridden the Burlington bus to the Lakeshore West GO train to the Toronto subway. By evening, I thought, public transit, why take the risk? In the next few days, we watched the neighbors in our high rise improvise procedures for wiping elevator buttons and door handles. We decided what friends to see at a safe six feet and whom to avoid. We anticipated terrifying trips to the grocery store and days of waiting for curbside pickup at Longo's. We learned that Lysol wipes and toilet paper had disappeared from the grocery shelves. I suggested to my husband, Jim, who just 11 months earlier had celebrated his 80th birthday and seemed particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, that he might be safer hiding out in our cottage in Wisconsin. His children in California and Oregon agreed. So that weekend, he drove our only car 1,200 kilometers west across the continent to isolate more easily from the invisible but life-threatening enemy that was evading us. A week later, the US and Canada announced that the border would close in less than 48 hours. Anxiety rose from my belly to constrict my throat and brought a new sense of panic into our separation. What to do, to stay put or to pack quickly and run for the border? Stay put, Jim advised. You can't run an institution from a thousand miles away. Jim and I are voluntary ecumenical associates at our congregation, St. Luke's Anglican in Burlington, in whose liturgy, color and sound and human interaction is organically important to the proclamation of God as the word. St. Luke's closed and began to post Sunday worship to the church website. Pre-COVID, Jim and I had our different ways of entering the sanctuary for worship. We usually arrived 15 minutes early, I took my seat in the fourth row, read the entire bulletin, and greeted people as they sat around me. Jim, always wearing a black clergy collar, meandered down the center aisle and slowly greeted every seated person. One by one, faces tipped toward him, eyes lit up. Each early arrival knew that for a few seconds they were remembered. They were the most important person in the world to the God represented by this big man in black. When I opened the video of worship, my husband and his familiar ritual were of course absent. I burst into tears. I called him sobbing. We have to at least watch it together. Later that week, I opened my email to find a message of frequently asked questions from the American consulate about the border closing. Can American citizens cross into the United States? Yes, American citizens can always return. Can American citizens who are permanent Can Canadian permanent residents return to Canada? Yes, they can return to Canada if they observe the 14 day quarantine. By now, I knew what I had to do. Now, stepping back, what's going on in this vignette? The writing is straightforward memoir. From the standpoint of the craft of writing, I am the strong protagonist on the page. The communities are the audience of the Fraser Center lecture, my church community in Burlington and my marriage. My husband is the only other actor in the story. I have his permission to tell the story. As a writer, I have no major ethical dilemmas with the named communities about sharing my story in public. My spirituality, which I'll define as the human spirit or soul on the page, is present when I recount the power of an important loss of ritual. Explicit theological claims are absent. The voice is open, epistemically hesitant, and makes no expert pronouncements on the human condition. It is more about spirituality than theology, which would require the introduction of a formal voice. Now to scene three, self-implicit, community explicit, open voice. 
A major storyline, and we are not all victims, in fact, the book's cover is the story of Mulimba, Alphonsine, and their children. And I will say that Alphonsine made the, the um, blouse that I'm wearing tonight. At the outbreak of war in Congo, they flee from the danger posed by the Rwandan invasion of Kabalo to the safety offered by the church's relief systems in Kamina, some 460 kilometers away. Over a series of chapters, I chronicle their eventual separation from one another, their different paths to safety in Kamina, the town of the, bishop, the, town of the bishop's headquarters, what they experienced in hunger, threat to their lives, and ethical decisions en route. In this scene, I describe the impact of their decision to flee as told by their teenage daughter, Sharita. Kabalo, Tankanyika District, September 18th, 1998. Sharita stood in the corner of the hut holding Dada on her hip while Eschler clung to the skirt of her blue and white school uniform. She felt like she was dizzy with malaria, that sensation of schools of fish running around in her head, pushing her down to fly flat. But she stood motionless, her dark eyes wide open and barely blinking. She tried to absorb the scene. In front of her, her parents and Patrice were digging a big hole in the earth and living floor, room floor while her grandparents piled the family's valuables nearby. Sharita had risen at dawn as normal, she dressed for school and sat down with her brothers and sisters to eat cassava, peanuts, and sweet potatoes while mama drank coffee. Then they heard the strange commotion outside, voices talking, crying out, feet scuffling in various directions, not along the trail toward the river to fetch the morning water, but toward the bush. Charita followed her parents back into the house and she stood in the corner minding the youngest children out of the way. She tried to steady herself. No fear, no fear, she repeated. But her eyes welled with tears when her prized possessions, her bicycle and mama's sewing machine were buried in the hole and covered with dirt. By noon, Wilumba, Alphonsine and their four children, Alphonsine's elderly parents and their household guests had picked their way into the bush and found a bit of shelter from the sun in a clump of trees beyond the back of the farm. All afternoon, they sat in the shade, watching groups of people weave their way through the scrub. They prayed. Occasionally, when a wanderer came close, Mwilumba intercepted him, hoping for good news, but it was not. Soldiers were coming. Black clouds rose on the horizon. Thunder cracked, and the sudden rain drenched everyone. By now they were thirsty and they welcomed the downpour. They stood with their hands outstretched and cupped, trying to catch the rain. They drank what they could and licked their hands and arms to quench their thirst. As night neared, the entire household, family and guests, sang hymns and folk songs. Patrice and Sharita harmonized, the pure sounds of young voices singing in perfect pitch calmed the wanderer's souls. Stepping back, what's going on in this vignette? It's the opposite of memoir. I, as the writer, am implicit on the page. The community about which I'm writing is explicit. The ethical dilemma is immediate. I am white, American, and well-fed. The bishop hosts people like me in guest accommodations that are concrete with a watertight roof, and a house that formerly housed American missionaries, one of the best in Kamina. I met Mwilumba during our first research trip in 2008, when the bishop assigned him as one of my three interpreters. Mwilumba and his family were still displaced, living in a temporary mud hut in a community of displaced people on the edge of town. In the audio file of our first interview about his story, Mwilumba says, ma'am, we are starving in the present tense. I rephrase what, phrase what he is saying to the past tense and he returns it to the present tense. In my interviewer's heart, 
I cannot bring myself to acknowledge such a vast difference between us and my, my own powerlessness. I am an observer, not a participant in their flight. I enter it imaginatively. To write it, I interview the family on multiple occasions, noticing sen uh, sensory details, watching their faces as they tell the story. I try to write their emotions onto the page. I am implicit, but not absent. The ethical problem is that I, an outsider to the story, am shaping the story. I am choosing the details, placing it in the structure of the overall narrative, can tell it well, or can tell it poorly, can tell it with a formal, open, or poetic voice. Each of us has motivations as we partner in this production. For Mulimba, it's an opportunity for social witness, to tell a story that the world otherwise wouldn't hear. It's also an opportunity to appeal to me for school fees for his children. And I do end up supporting his son in Buyu through pre-medical school. For me, it's an exercise of vocation, the fulfillment of a scholarly and ecclesial calling of both academic tenure and ordination and a highly privileged expansion of my need to connect with another culture. The opportunity to interview the Luba Congolese witnesses, nearly all of whom had a, flight to, a, story, a story of flight to tell, changed me. Their hardships in the bush permanently reside in my imagination. They faced everyday perils, vulnerability and tragedy from hunger, lack of shelter, fear of physical and sexual violence, and trauma when they came across death along the way. And they did not have the benefit of communications technology to keep in touch. All they had was the word of mouth among the displaced people they met in the winding paths through the Congo bush. They hoped in the accurate efforts of the people of Kamina who were keeping track of arrivals. In COVID, I identified with their sense of threat, fear and determination, with the sudden total reversal of all the norms of life, with the loss of place, the separation from possessions, with the sense of life's surreality and the impulsive decisions made without enough information, with the discovery that a life-changing, disorienting phase of life has begun. Mwilumba's family and I both turn to elements of what I call primary practical theology for resilience, particularly music and hymns, prayers and scripture readings. We differ in the way we encounter the spiritual world. For Alphonsine and her children, ethical decisions take seriously the realm of ancestral and family spirits. As she decides whether to collect dead infants and orphans and bring them to safety, she must negotiate between the values of her Christian faith to love her, their neighbor and the Congolese worldview that considers deeply the consequences of trespassing the boundaries of a family or offending the ancestors. For me, the parallel spiritual ethical question is quite different and has to do with negotiating between Christian faith and the norms of capitalism. What to do about possessions, employment and vocation, residence, international boundaries and retirement funds. Nancy Berry at the Iowa Writing Festival taught me that the most important feedback a reader can give is the movie of the mind. So what's going on in the mind of the reader as they read so that the writer knows whether they are communicating what they intend. Reading is the tip of the iceberg. It's the imagination of the reader when stirred where the most expansive work occurs. After COVID, the movie of the mind in the reader of We Are Not On All Victims will have a life of its own I could never anticipate. For Mulimba, Alphonsine, and their family, displacement led to a different life. They did not recover their farm. Life as they knew it never returned. We in Canada and the US are now imagining the possibility of the return to life after our flight 
whether our flight was across a continent or hunkering down into the safety of our own homes and apartments. The experience of return was recorded in 1966 by my former professor, theologian Langdon Gilkey in his book, Shantung Compound. Scene three, writer explicit, community explicit, combination of open and formal voice. In 1943, Gilkey was a 24-year-old college graduate who had been teaching English in China. When the Japanese arrived, Gilkey was interred in Weizian, a site of the former Presbyterian mission. The book begins. This book is about the life of a civilian internment camp in North China during the war against Japan. Unlike other volumes dealing with such a subject, this one has no horrors to relate. From these words, Gilkey sets the stage for his story. 2,000 people, largely unknown to each other, were marched into a barricaded camp with no hope for escape. They organized their shelter, food, sanitation, and medical needs. His story has much in common with We Are Not All Victims, in that the bulk of that story is about the way the Congolese people of Kamina use their skills to care for displaced people among them, and many displaced people themselves became organizers and caregivers. In the third paragraph of his book, Gilkey creates what the writer, what writers call the contract with the reader, answering the reader's question, how can a story about 1943 be considered true in 1966? Gilkey writes, I kept a rather lengthy journal during the internment in which we were set down every in which were set down every fact and happening, every problem and its resolution that came to my attention. Thus, the main resource for these chapters stands very close to the life described, for the journal was largely written in camp and was completed shortly after my return to the United States in November 1945. The first 13 chapters are largely memoir. He traces the way internment causes him to question his liberal Protestant upbringing and then to lose his faith in God. He observes and documents the moral dilemmas leaders face while trying to tend inequities that arise in the midst of scarcity, Gilkey says. Over and over what we can only call moral or spiritual difficulties continue, continually cropped up. Crises occurred that involved not a breakdown in techniques, but a breakdown in character and show the need for moral integrity and self-sacrifice. The trouble with my new humanism, I found myself deciding, was not its confidence in human science and technology. It was rather its naive and unrealistic faith in the rationality and goodness of the people who wielded these instruments. It became increasingly plain that these crises of the soul were so serious that they threatened the very existence of our community. And he writes this particularly telling scene as his introduction to the ethical problem. A deputation of three single men appeared in the quarters office. When asked what they wanted, they re replied a trifle aggressively, I thought, fair treatment from the housing committee. Gilkey was on the housing committee. Taken aback by this, I nevertheless said confidently, sure, and that's what you'll get. What's up and how can we help you? Our case is quite simple, said the elderly head of the group, an ex-soldier lamed by World War I and formerly the proprietor of a small bookshop shop in Tencent. We three, and he looked at the other two, a young American tobacco man and a British schoolmaster, live in a dormitory room in block 49. There are 11 men in our small room and we have barely the space to turn around, much less stow our stuff in any comfort. Across the hall is a room exactly the same size, isn't it chaps? The other two nodded in agreement. Apparently two of them had measured it while the third held its unsuspecting inmates in conversation. In that room, there are only nine men and in ours 11. Now we suggest that you rectify this obvious injustice by moving one of our men in with them. Surely that's fair enough, isn't it, chaps? The other two mumbled in grim agreement. 
I must admit I felt elated. Here at last was a perfectly clear cut case. Surely the injustice in this situation was, if ever it was in life, clear and distinct. Since the rooms were next to each other, anyone who could, like Descartes, count and measure could see the inequity involved. The solution was easy. If we did move one man, then each room would have 10 persons. Are not people rational and moral, I asked myself. Gilkey learned they are not. The nine responded in a way that Gilkey discovered would be characteristic of camp reasoning. Sure, we're sorry for those chaps over there, but what has that got to do with us? We're plenty crowded in here as it is, and their worries are tough luck. Listen, old boy, we're not crowding up for you or for anyone. Gilkey recounts other such stories about the way people manage food, how the black market develops, is disrupted and redevelops, and the struggle of people to share their material goods recording in his observations of incidents in camp. At the end of his book, he discusses the disorientation he faces when, in 1943, he re-enters the wealth of American society in Chicago. In the post-war US, politics demanded that the public discuss the Marshall Plan and other forms by which the US would share its wealth with the world. After addressing a woman's group about his experience in Shantung compound and connecting the struggles he saw there to contested US politics, he is roundly rejected by the chairwoman of the group who draws a clear distinction between material and spiritual issues. Gilkey reflects, I tasted in its bitter comedy, the irony of the human situation. It was this very deception, necessary for conscience sake, that allowed them to ignore the claims of their neighbors on their comfort, that made them delight in sharing their faith, but not their food with a starving world. Only those, so I'm used, who can understand, if not by experience, then by sympathy, the full weight of material want and so the value of material goods can possibly comprehend what the real spiritual issues of life are. For to wish and seek for justice in material things for one's neighbor is perhaps the highest of spiritual attainments, since it is in the expression of social relations of what it means to love one's neighbor. A healthy spirituality, to be spiritual and not callous, must affirm the material order and concern itself with it, with housing, food, warmth, and comfort. So do the material and spiritual realms, the secular and the religious, not exclude, but cry out for one another. In this interchange between theory and experience, I began to see some glimmering of answers to the questions which, which camp life has raised. Stepping back, what is the relationship between the eye of the writer and the community in this book? Both the self of the writer and the community are equally foregrounded in that the writer is a member of the community. He is equally telling the story of the community and then of the community's effect on his own young adult growth and thought a universal connection that makes the story interesting apart from character, plot, and suspense. He is telling the story of others as he sees it, not as the community might, and he resolves the writer's immediate ethical problem by preserving their on anonymity. I have changed every name of every person in this book, he says. Gilkey's primary dilemma in the book, however, is whether or how to reconstruct his Christian faith and his theology after internment. While the story is structured to posit this question and to show how the younger Gilkey ponders it while interred, the older Gilkey's answer comes in the last entirely theological and now formal chapter. Here the spiritual and the theological eye is explicit front and center on the page. The community goes backstage. After interment, Gilkey studies with Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich at Union Theological Seminary, and their influence is obvious. His methodology follows Tillich's correlational method in which the questions arising from humanity are answered theologically with many insights about the depth of humanity's inevitable sin that we associate with Niebuhr. 
He concludes the book with a testimony that might be equally apt when we think about COVID in Canada or flight from Congo, male language change to allow the passage to speak to the present. We need God because our precarious and contingent lives can find final significance only in God's almighty and eternal purposes. And because their fragmentary selves must find their ultimate center only in God's transcendent love. If the meaning of people's lives is centered solely in their own achievements, these too are vulnerable to the twists and turns of history and their lives will always teeter on the abyss of pointlessness and inertia. And if people's ultimate loyalty is centered in themselves, then the effect of their lives on others around them will be destructive of that community on which all depend. Only in God is there an ultimate loyalty that does not breed injustice and cruelty and a meaning from which nothing in heaven and earth can separate us. When Gilkey wrote, religious practice was still part of the assumptive world of the American cultural landscape. In the 50 plus years since Gilkey's writing, sociologists and cultural theorists have traced the decline of religious practice in the North Atlantic countries. And as it is into this lacuna that a fifth kind of spiritual life writing speaks. Scene number five, explicit self, implicit community, poetic voice. Heather Walton is a British practical theologian in Scotland who writes directly to the situation of theology in a secularized society. In her 2020 article for the uh, Toronto School of Theology 50th anniversary edition of the Toronto Journal of Theology, entitled A Poet Theopoetic in Ruins, the metaphor of ruins repeats itself throughout the article. She begins, as a theologian and writer, I am fascinated by a terse passage from the second chapter of John's gospel. Jesus is introduced as the zealous defender of the temple of God, yet straight away announces its destruction and impossible restoration. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. His critics respond, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? The passage ends, but they did not know what he, that he was speaking about the temple of his body. I am drawn by both the ambivalent relation to tradition and also the striking poetic contrasts, eliaisons, relations, and transformations this small narrative contains. The sacred building in ruins, the body damaged, wounded, and destroyed stone and flesh and derelict communion. What is solid and insensible bleeding into that which is warm, fleshly, moral, and vulnerable. A body in ruins, broken stone, flesh, faith. The altars have been torn down and the stones scattered. What was once so vital and warm is still silent. Throughout the piece, Walton centers, circles back to imagery of ruins as the metaphor for the role of theopoetics in the culture of North Atlantic countries to which she is writing. She uses the work of cultural the theorists, particularly Charles Taylor and Michel de Certeau, to characterize this wor world. A thesis statement for her recent project is tucked into the second page of the article. For me then, the change is to seize again this world of wonders and horrors quite differently. But grasping and revisioning religious speech within a post-secular or enchanted understanding of culture is difficult work. It entails, first of all, comprehending that the theological edifice is no longer habitable, but stands in ruins. It then requires an acknowledgement that this destruction is not simply to be regretted. Theology does not simply lack imagination and communicative vitality. It has also been dreadfully complicit in the abuse of power and profoundly neglectful of human suffering. What is needed is the confrontation of theology with the claims it has denied and the creation of God's speech beyond the forms in which it is currently expressed. <clears throat> 
I am seeking a theopoetics that can communicate in the context of broken stone flesh faith. Stepping back, what's going on in Walton's writing? Walton knows that what she has to say theologically is directly related to how she says it. She varies her writing style according to the audience to which it is addressed, to her peers, to her students. The eye is always explicit on the page. The community to whom she is writing is directly addressed. The reader encountering driving metaphors, such as theology in ruins, with sensory experience. We know what it is like to walk among ruins by how it looks, sounds, tastes, smells. Various experiences of walking in ruins allow Walton to plumb the horrors and enchantment of that theology can express. The metaphorical and storied elements in her writings, part and parcel of her theme, are drawn from everyday life and from scripture. Her work is intensely biblical. So for example, her presidential address at the 2015 International Academy of Practical Theology was structured by her literary paraphrase of the story of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Her work is constructive, but not systematic. Rather, she depends on bricolage, pieces of theology she finds in her everyday environment. So within so many losses, within the loss of life as we knew it, whether in Congo or Canada or China or Great Britain, what can be found? Warland finds a decolonized spirituality in Lost Lagoon. I find within my flight and that of Mwilimba and Alphonsine glimpses of lived religion. Gilkey finds within formal propositional theology words to express the experience of finding faith after the internment experience. Walton finds that the biblical story and metaphors of life as bricolage reveal theology in a secular culture. And in each case, communities are represented who are practicing faith. Walton's work has profound implications for how we teach theology. Her book, After Eden, a text for students, discusses various writing styles and then demonstrates them. Her work implies that we must go beyond teaching our students to write formal didactic prose with an implicit eye and generalized communities. Rather, teaching them at least some elements of creative writing is a necessary tool if we seek to allow the phoenix of theology to rise from the ashes of secularizing culture. It's important to allow students the opportunity to write with their eye and with their explicit communities on the page, for they will be the ones whose wings lift new theology into expression. A postscript. The community of Toronto School of Theology spent the last year writing a massive quality assurance report, and all of the schools are writing accrediting self-studies for the Association of Theological Schools. These self-studies are often developed with the fear of loss and the memory of wounds. They hope for a future to be found. In writing, these institutional self-studies are authored, edited, vetted, revised, restyled. They are formal documents following very prescribed outlines. The community is explicit, foregrounded, and the I of the various sections of the document is blended into the we of the community. In every case, we are writing about a theology school, but are we doing any theology in these documents? Is our spirituality made manifest? We must write about our degree programs, our pedagogy and our institutional structures, but is the theological practice in which we are engaged so buried that we cannot express it on paper. When we write these self-studies, are we, as Walton so aptly puts it, writing within Easter Saturday, when it seems theology is silent? Or is the Holy Spirit of the theological endeavor in some way written onto the page 
waiting for the tomb to be opened. Should we be asking theological questions of these documents into which we pour our spiritual blood and our faith every seven to 10 years? As one who led the quality assurance self-study writing for TST, I can confidently say that my faith in the theological practice of this community is written into every page, just as my faith in the religious peace building of Kamina was written onto every page of We Are Not All Victims. Because we are writing about theological communities, mustn't it be so? And then now in the way in which my Luba Cong Congolese friends in Kamina would say it, I give the floor to Esther to complete me. Professor Akalatse. I also want to thank John Dadoski and the Fraser Center for the opportunity to respond to our lecture. And thank you, Pam, for allowing me into the story and asking that I complete you in the manner of the Luba. It fell on good ears. I come from West Africa and cut my storytelling teeth on that of the famous Griots, who were a touring band of spinners of wise tales. In Africa, storytelling is a communal ritual. Even if everyone knows the story, we listen again because story listening is how we call ourselves together and affirm our unity. A key feature of storytelling and story listening is the participation of the audience in the telling of the story. Often when the tale is such that even the suspension of disbelief is not enough to allow for the credence in the story, or if the story seems too fanciful, someone would interject, I was there that day, I was there that day. The storyteller yields the floor and issues an invitation to the challenger of the tale. For I was there that day is usually followed with a ditty that intends to challenge the, ver the veracity of the narrative, which is usually about the wily spider. The point of the ditty is to invite the storyteller to stop embellishing the tale to the point of making false statements and reminding her that lies kill. After all, stories are about life, and we listen to feel out how to live more fully. And so I am the one in Pam's storytelling community, interjecting and exclaiming, I was there that day, I was there that day. And as she has set up the symphony in my mind in three movements, I follow her interjecting three comments and a final word. And as my people say, I will give her back her tongue so she may carry on her story. My people also have two proverbs that frame my response. One has to do with the suspicion of the outsider who weeps more than the bereaved. And the other, that before a stranger dips his fingers into the hidden pot of soup, a villager must have led the way. First interjection. I was there that day. I was there that day. What does it mean to write another's life? As practical theologians, we are always involved in looking at and into other people's lives, reading those lives, writing those lives, and always run the risk 
of not just destroying story, but de-storying lives. The form in which we restory the lies narrated for us matter. For story decides everything. For without your story, you have not been. The invitation to be careful, I read as being full of care rather than walk gingerly for fear of falling off the ridge. For being full of care overcomes the tendency to run roughshod over the terrain. A self-explicit community, explicit poetic voice becomes for me the most appropriate way to story a people. Yet how much openness may be too much? Can the formal and terse grammar of English linguistic structures capture the story of say a people with very different philosophical linguistic grammar steeped in pithy sayings and proverbs and deliberate opacity to force listening with the whole being rather than the ears? I was there. I was there and hear the poetic voice and perhaps even the self-explicit voice. But might the communal voice always underscored be muted regardless? And could this be a good thing? Second interjection. I was there that day. I was there that day. Memoirs, self-explicit community, implicit and open voice. I was drawn into this story and carried along with it. Perhaps because it is your story, but also my story and the story of many US citizens who are permanent residents of Canada. I found I was more in this story than even the story you share of your work in the Congo to which I might even be more related culturally. But I think it's because I'm related to the story twice as a person of both the earthly and heavenly citizenry to which we both belong. I wonder though whether what is going on in this vignette has both your spirituality and theology explicit, even though you thought that your theology was muted. Is it possible that you could be making an artificial distinction between spirituality and theology? Could a story listener theologize what seems to be long grief in process? Would a formal voice be an intrusion even in theology in this regard? Soon we will be in Holy Week when we speak of the passion narratives of Jesus weeping in Gethsemane, is it spirituality or theology? How much theology have we woven from this Holy Week with its personal story of grief and loss found in hymnody, which might or might not be a formal voice? I'm also thinking here of the many ways theology pours out spontaneously in such poetic language in African worship, you probably experienced it. In short, I wonder if making the distinction takes away from what I see as the aim of your project. Third interjection. I was there that day, I was there that day inside, outside, at the border is the viewing point. What is the retelling voice that most captures a story when the cross-cultural dimension is brought to bear on it? I began by saying that I was framing this response with two African proverbs, one that is suspicious of the gaze of the outsider 
and the other, that the outsider must have been invited by the insider. There is a mutuality of hospitality then in the telling and hearing of the story. But can there be the danger of overstorying or understorying and thus de story? Hmm. Can even the moderately rich theologically imagine the life of the poor? I'm middle class African and I have a dead. I appreciated the foray into what I see as faulty theological anthropology that separated material from, uh, from spiritual, a la Gilkey's uh, memoir. And wonder if it does not still go on even in our front steps and backyards. You don't have to go to Congo mm -hmm. or Shanto. I celebrate the agency and resilience you capture and the way you allow us to hear the people in their own words. But I also know the difficulty communication poses when one dreams in another language and has to express it in a foreign tongue. So I'm speaking English, but I can't think in English. Do you hear me? Or do you hear the words I have borrowed from you to tell you what I need to say? So what voice most conveys what is dreamed? How can we make sure that the one or the me you see and the you who sees me can both be identified in the voice on the page, especially when we speak of suffering? which is what marks us as human. Even a newborn comes through the birth canal, suffering starts. The God factor. Among the Akan, because many of the stories told are about the spider Anansi, we tend to call fanciful tales, fairy tales, Anansi Sem, that is Anansi stories. You believe them at your peril. The obverse of Anansi Sem is what Messi Oduye calls Nyanko Sem, God talk or God tales. And the latter is from Nyame, the sky god. And the word also connotes great friend, because the friend is the one who knows you most intimately. It is in the acknowledgement of possibilities that one could be told Nyankosem, that is God talk, as if it were Anansisem fairy tale, and vice versa, that we listen to stories with care and listen together. So I'm hearing in this journey from Congo to Canada, a move for a practical theology as contemplative scholarship without apology. Mm. To do so, we must rethink theology and thus God. We have to move away from a God of power who is seen as always primary, totalizing, monopolistic, omnipotent, ultimate, and all the other adjectives you know. Without the image of the vulnerable God. We must see our theology of a suffering God that draws others in and who in the incarnation demonstrates an openness to other and difference. Real theology, not theologology, that is talking about talking about God, has the expansiveness to seed place to other disciplines and even to be seen as less than. It is with this understanding that we can undertake a practical theology in its theopoetic form as suggested by Pam Kucher, without 
the attendant baggage of whether this is scholarly academic enterprise or not. Anansisem or Nyankusem, fairy tale or God talk. Perhaps in this invitation, we might be signaling our death. We are already the bottom of the bottom of the bottom where theology is concerned. <laughs> but it's not that the way to life. I cannot wait to see what the challenges to practical theology, but much more the promise to theology in general will be if we heed this call. My mouth has fallen. I give you back your turn. I said Esther would complete me, and she has definitely done that, hasn't she? Wonderful response, Esther. Thank you so much. That's so wonderful. Thank you, Professor Akalate. Um, Professor Kutcher, do you, would you like to respond to anything she said before we open it up for questions? No, I think I'm looking at the time. It's 11. 7-Eleven, I think we should take questions and respond at the end of the questions, maybe. Okay. Let, so the, let the gathered group get into the story. <laughs> if anyone uh, from the audience would like to, to submit a question to the pam panelists, please do so now. Or a comment. I, I was really impressed by both of your um, uh, really just beautiful way with words and um, you know, I come from a tradition where theology does tend to get abstract. And uh, so there's always this tension between that and narrative theology and uh, what's proper praxis. Um, I, um, I guess the, que what, the question that came to me when you were exploring your different vignettes is, you know, in a, in a family, so just an example, in a family where there's trauma, say one sibling gets abused, another sibling doesn't, the sibling that doesn't get abused has uh, survivor guilt, as they call it. So I guess when I, I think about practical theology and you, the wounds of the world, the pain of the world can be so overwhelming at times. And what am I to do? What is, what is supposed to be the proper response? Um, when I know I can't solve the world's problems, what's the proper practical response in, in these situations that came to me and um, and what came to me with um, Professor Akalatse is what, what is this vulnerable God uh, that you advocate for? Um, is there going to be a victory? <laughs> or is, is, it, is it about just suffering and, and in, some, in, in many cases, the righteous being defeated, like what's um, uh, the resurrection? So I guess those were some thoughts that came to me when both of you were speaking. If you'd like to comment individually on those, that'd be great. So I'm interested in what Esther thinks about the question of writing, writing about tragedy. Um, so when I wrote, we are not all victims. And this is, I think this goes to the comment you made Esther about overwriting the story. When I, I was determined to write about the peace building activity of the people, but as I, and I figured there were enough people who were taught writing about the tragedy of the Congo war. Mm -hmm. But in the course of writing the story, as people told me the story of suffering trauma violence, et cetera. There were some things I had to write in as what I hoped was backstory. Mm -hmm. The question I had, and, and I, I felt that I, I really tried to discern what of the stories were important to them. So probably the most difficult story in the book, which anybody who's read it will know exactly which one I'm talking about. And I'm not gonna 
summarize it, um, is one that I've thought over and over again, should I have left it out? I knew it was very important to Alphonsine because I knew it was important to what her experience was on that Congolese path and the fear of, of violence. On the other hand, and I heard her repeat it in different years, different research trips. On the other hand, is it overriding the story in the sense that it makes the story so difficult for the reader to read that it's not, that it turns the reader away from the primary activity of the story, which is the amazing work that people are doing. Mm -hmm. And I, Esther, I would like to know what you think about that. Where is the line of writing about tragedy and about suffering in terms of, I mean, you talked so beautifully about the, the, the line that we have to walk on or walk down um, when we're doing that. And, and people are invariably writing about suffering. We're going to be writing about a lot of suffering and a lot of tragedy. Where is the line where we're walking, where we're overwriting the story? And what would you say out of the African storytelling tradition that you so beautifully recounted? I've heard, I have my own Luba version of having heard that, heard the, you know, the person coming in and out and interrupting, et cetera. Um, I just want to know where you think the line is there. Mm, thank you. I, I will answer that and then uh, talk about the uh, vulnerable God and, and whether there is a resurrection in our future. Uh, you and I are both in pastoral theology, I believe. And we, we have the concept of re-wounding. Mm -hmm. So for me, the basic rule becomes, will this story re-wound in a way that yeah. brings healing? Yeah. Or will it constantly leave a gaping wound? Because we know that sometimes we have to re-wound in order to have proper healing. If you set a bone badly, we have to break it mm -hmm. to reset it. If that is what is happening in the telling or even over telling, then there is something cathartic about it. But if it is voyeurism, mm -hmm. if it is the juiciest piece of story you have that will blow people you know, away reading, you have to judge that for yourself. So even if it has been told and retold, maybe for the person telling, you know, it is assuaging grief. You have to weigh whether to write it on, even if it's been repeated. Because yeah. I remember how many times, you know, uh, somebody dies and, or your, your husband dies and they sit you there and every time somebody else comes in, you tell them the story of how it is you were here and you went to the hospital and they died. And I used to wonder, why can't they let this person rest? Mm -hmm. But you, 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 you say it until you are tuned to it and then we can do the work that comes from you. So people may be telling you this, but that is how we believe. Yeah, and I think that for Alphonsine, the way she told it, the quality with which she told the story when she told it, said it, 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 it speaks to the world in which she lived in and was resilient and brave in despite the, the kind of the, the, the fears that she had to walk in. And I think it represented the kinds of fears that, that, that she had to walk in. And in that point, to leave it out would have been dishonest. Mm -hmm. To keep it in is honest for the writer. The question is whether it then turns away some of the readers. I mean, I know that there are some people who have picked up this book who've not been able to get through it basically. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a matter of, you know, not a matter of putting it in because it's voyeuristic. It's a matter of putting it in because because frankly, yeah. I would have liked to eliminate all that, but it's a matter of putting it in because it's, it's mm -hmm. an honest mm -hmm. description of the world. But go, mm -hmm. go to your question about the vulnerable God, because 
you know, what, what I'm interested in too about this is where is the vulnerable human and the vulnerable God and your question about spirituality and theology in the midst of all of that vulnerability? Um, <laughs> tell us, Esther. Um, well, I, I'm thinking of how many African languages still retain God as mother and father mm -hmm. in how we, we call God. Maulis. Actually, in my language, uh, when they elided one name, what stays? The Mau is, is female. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is the transcendent one who no one can kill, but who also can kill because the play on words. Uh, it says that, but this is the mother of all, and this is also the father of all. And the, the vulnerability and the power go together in African concepts of, of God. There's a sense in which we picked up a, a Western, you know, phallic God without the attendant womb, which you, you mm -hmm. find in Hebraic folk constantly. Mm. And so that is where the vulnerability comes. What about humans who are vulnerable? We come from a culture where um, you look out for the outsider. I mean, I always say white people who have come and taken our land if we do think, oh, you know, nobody owns things that antedate them. You know, so you look out for the vulnerable, you look out for for, for, for the lowly and poor. <laughs> but we have come to learn otherwise because you keep doing that, you go down. Can we keep doing that and still continue to have agency it becomes the problem. So there's a sense mm -hmm. in which what it means to be human is subtly changing. I mean, I've been away from, from Africa 30 years. When I go back home, I'm thinking, Really, this is not who we were, you know. It's subtly changing. Can we learn from a vulnerable God how to be a vulnerable human without being elided? I'm not sure. <laughs> but is there a resurrection in the, in the future? Absolutely. But we also as Africans do not have a concept of resurrection. I mean, you may blare it and we may dance it in church, but I'm not sure that we actually, actually believe it because we haven't transcended our cultural moment. Our Christianity has not yet transcended its cultural moment. Uh, we, we may fight about that later. But what about the, the benevolent, the village of the benevolent ancestors? Yes, you see. Is that, is that not is resurrection? Spirit, yes, because this is a spirit world from whence you came and to which you return. We don't believe in the resurrection of the body and the life to come. You were a spirit that came and you went back. Interesting. Uh, we did get a question through the chat. Um, uh, we have a few minutes left to, to take this question. Um, what advice do you have for students and scholars, and this is directed to both of you, uh, who are seeking to do theology in the ways which you speak, yet must also live and work and minister in spaces that see theology as requiring certain Western academic assumptions and norms? I think, I think this is what your project is about. Mm -hmm. And so you should. But so, say it, give us an answer that is pre tenure. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I didn't write a book like this till I got tenure and was a full professor. <laughs> You know, this is, and I tell my students this, I said, this is, this is the, this is the book you can take the big risk with because in some respects it's a failure as a book. I mean, it's a failure as, as a, as a project, um, you know, by the standards of 
how many citations do you get and how widely read is it? And, you know, all that kind of thing. I mean, my first book had 16 reviews. This one had four, you know. Um, but the, the world of publishing has changed in those 30 years too. I think that's where we, as those who have taken that risk and who know something about the storytelling craft, craft because we have because we have studied it and, or because we have learned it at the feet of our parents as you have Esther, we have to have some handles on that, which is what I was trying to do in the stepping back portions so that we can teach our students what it is they're doing when they do these things, when they do this kind of writing. So that it's not just, I mean, the people who are in the Canadian Creative Nonfiction Collective, for example, they study the craft of writing. They don't just get up and do it. And I think for our students to just think they can just get up and tell their own story is leaving them without the handles of how you craft the words that go into story in that kind of a way. And, and there are some really good books out there. I've got a bibliography of, of books actually that, I, that, that if, I, if I ever do anything with this piece, I would put on it. Um, uh, there's some there's some really good books that can help people do that, um, but but I would say that that's that 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 for us as teachers we have to help our students who want to do this do this in a way to do mm -hmm. it well and not to take it for granted because mm -hmm. it's not something that you take for granted. You, we have been schooled in the formal voice, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would say also the part of the question comes to me as, can I wear my faith on my sleeve and write? And I think yeah. that I have done it even with my dissertation from Princeton. And I think that you can do it. But I always say the risk is, what is your life with God like? <laughs> mm -hmm. Because you have to know that this is the time to do that. Tenure or no tenure, and, and you have to know without any shadow of doubt where God is calling you to. You know, so you're holding on to God's skirts or loincloth or whatever you want, and, and, and you know he falls before you fall. Well, and I also think that there are there are some you know some some really amazing pathfinders. So I would say Heather Walton's a great example. I know, I think Natalie's on this call somewhere. The mm -hmm. kind of work she's doing is highly poetic and very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, and again, she's in that, in that pathfinding um, stream of things. Um, I Willie think Jennings the people, is another. Willie Jennings is another one. And I looked at his book for this, this as an example of this tonight also. Um, there are several people out there who are doing this. And to be able to develop the, the bibliography of where people are beginning to combine these different voices into a theological voice and then to figure out how they're doing it. I mean, mm -hmm. that I think is the job that we have as the teacher to help the student move into this kind of writing and move into it faster than we did. Mm -hmm. um, now, I take it back, faster than I did, not faster than you did, Esther. You, you, you stepped right on up, but again, that goes to the issue of your language. You know, the, the issue, okay, so as I began to learn some Swahili, I learned how much different this would be if I knew Swahili in a way that I could have done this and listened to the primary interviews in Swahili, okay? Some of them were, well, they were in Kiswahili, some of them were in French, some of them were in Luba, that was a whole nother story, mm -hmm. and then some of them, you know, some of them were in English. What I did have was the, was the, um, everything was done in English by African translators so that I was getting their English. Yeah. And the way in which they, so there were these various sets of translation that went along in order to, to hear how they told the story in English. Um, the issue now is for, for, is whether the book will get translated back into either Kiswahili or, fr or French, probably French first. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, you can't, you're absolutely right that the, that the, the language issues are so called, the culture is expressed by the language so much mm 
-hmm. especially in the way in which the language is constructed and the proverbs that you were talking about. Um, there is a, a magnificent unpublished unpublic, dissertation from Temple University by, in, um, um, I'm sorry, Senga. I can't, I'll know it as soon as I get off the call, right? I'll, I'll be able to pull it out. I printed all thousand pages of it and I've got it in two ring king binders. He goes through this whole history of the proverbs of the Luba language and what they mean. And you remember, I used some of those in my, in, mm -hmm. in, in my, mm -hmm. my presentation in Pretoria, but um, it, it, the level of richness to it that I can't begin to create, recreate. I mean, yeah. I just can't, you know, I just can't, I just couldn't, couldn't, I, I can't do, but then we have to live with the limits, you know, yeah. we have to live with our limitations. But, but yeah. as long as we know we are living with the limits and don't yeah. say, yeah. so we can't be dogmatic about it. No, no. And we have to, we, you know, we have to live with the limits that we have and then, and then try to take the risks that we can, t can, can take, try to help others take the risks. Yeah, we'll build a cat. Yes. Well, I want to thank you both again uh, for this. You're both on the cutting edge of bringing an important complement to theology that's needed. Um, and uh, it's just been a rich discussion.